some of the most breathtaking and majestic scenery in the world. A place where one might see peace and tranquility, the other sees a challenge and a lifelong dream. For Captain Robbie Knievel, this dream was to jump his motorcycle across the Grand Canyon. Three weeks ago today, this was the scene the day Robbie was to make that dream become a reality. Snow, sleet, and freezing rain made this monumental jump more risky for this world-renowned daredevil. The ramps are still wet all over the place. The crosswinds are still gusting. Robbie has no way to abort. I'm not going to jump my motorcycle in front of a bunch of little kids and kill myself today. So for now, the jump remains a dream. I'm a survivor. I've never backed out of anything. I'm Captain Robbie Knievel. I will be back, 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 back. Tonight, one man and one motorcycle stand face to face with the single most dangerous act ever attempted on live television. Captain Robbie Knievel's Grand Canyon Death Jump. Live, 2,000 feet deep. 100 miles an hour in an attempt to shatter his world record. Tonight, the stakes have never been higher when Captain Robbie Knievel attempts a Grand Canyon death jump live. Indeed, Robbie Knievel is back, and we are back live here at Grand Canyon West. And the question remains, can anyone jump a motorcycle from one side of the canyon over the rocky cliffs, across the 2,000-foot deep gorge, and land on the other side. It certainly will be a feat unlike anything the world has ever seen and could only be attempted by the undisputed superstar of Daredevils, Captain Robbie Knievel. Good evening, I'm Mark Thompson. From the desert of the Grand Canyon, we're here for another attempt at what is, in light of recent events, no doubt one of the most highly anticipated motorcycle jumps in history. You'll recall it was just three weeks ago that bad weather temporarily washed out Robbie's dream of jumping a motorcycle across the Grand Canyon. That first try ended in frustration and disappointment as Robbie was forced to cancel the jump without even getting a shot at it. Here's what happened. Grand Canyon West, just three days before Robbie Knievel's scheduled jump across the canyon. As the production trucks and crew rolled in to set up for the live broadcast, clear skies quickly gave way to clouds and rain. The takeoff and landing ramps were much steeper than Robbie was used to, and he had several practice jumps planned. As the week progressed, a cold front moved in, bringing winds of over 40 miles per hour and temperatures below freezing. Team Knievel waited in vain for the weather to pass. But the day of the jump, the weather intensified, bringing snow and sleet. This is the same storm that eventually moved east, producing the deadly Oklahoma tornadoes, some with winds over 300 miles per hour that caused massive devastation. The weather did clear later that day, but the ramps were ruined beyond repair, and the lack of time to prepare forced Robbie to cancel the jump. Analysts and experts concurred with that decision, and most conclude that under these conditions, once off the ramp, Robbie would have been blown sideways and down, smashing into the canyon walls at close to 100 miles an hour. And so we're back in this most majestic of natural wonders, this time, as you can see, under sunny skies, for another attempt at what seems unnatural. I'm joined tonight by Susie Culber and Dan Moriarty, and Susie is on the far side of the canyon, on the safety deck of the landing ramp. Susie? Well, Mark, they may call this the safety deck, but if Robbie lands right here, he'll crash. In fact, the way this landing is structured, there's better than a 50% chance that he will crash. I mean, when he takes off from the other side of the canyon, he can't even see the landing ramp. In just moments, we'll speak with Gary Davis, his stunt coordinator, about what makes this jump so dangerous. We'll also hear from Robbie's mom and his kids, and finally, Robbie himself, just moments before this death-defying jump. But right now, let's send it over to Dan Moriarty. Thanks, Susie. I'm here at Robbie's practice jump site. Now, Robbie Knievel has never allowed his practice jumps to be filmed. So this is an exclusive before he goes over the canyon. Now, why would you do this? Well, we're at 5,000 feet. Check the altitude, check the bearings, make sure the bike is locked in. Why? Going over the Grand Canyon, you don't want any mistakes. 
And exactly. it'll be an environment, it'll be an environment, Dan, that will be very difficult to avoid making a mistake. The winds here have been kicking up very unexpectedly. We'll talk more about that as the broadcast continues. You know, almost as incredible as the Grand Canyon jump itself is the fact that a television city has sprung up from an area in the middle of the desert that before we arrived here had no power, no phones, no food, no water, nothing. Let's take a look at what it took to bring this live television event to you tonight. Grand Canyon West is located on the west edge of Grand Canyon National Park, 125 miles east of Las Vegas. In order to broadcast this incredible stunt live, we had to pack up a cast and crew of over 100 people, put them in Sahara motorhomes, trek into the desert, and build a small self-contained city. The massive 800-foot-long takeoff ramp, towering 31 feet above the canyon's edge, together with the landing ramp, required over 115,000 pounds of steel and 20,000 man-hours of labor. The landing area looms in the distance, 20 feet high and 170 feet long. It is the biggest, widest ramp superstructure ever created for a motorcycle jump. The angle of the ramp and the speed required to cross the gap will send Robbie so high that he'll be falling over 45 feet to his landing. That's the equivalent of jumping off a five-story building to reach the other edge of this 2,000-foot deep portion of Grand Canyon West. We cannot emphasize enough the danger associated with the landing on this jump, even if the weather conditions were perfect. We're going to talk to a man now who's been involved in the design of motorcycle stunts for over 25 years. His name is Gary Davis. He started as a motorcycle daredevil himself, as a matter of fact. One of his first big films was when he doubled for Evil Knievel. He has gone on to become an award-winning stunt coordinator in television and major motion pictures, including U.S. Marshals and Terminator 2. And Susie is with Gary Davis right now. Susie? Gary, let's assume that Robbie clears the 2,000-foot drop. He's not home free. What don't you like about this landing? Susie, it's certainly no uh, surprise to anybody that I don't like the way the ramps are set up. This ramp is much lower than I would like to see it. They, they should start in the same plane, but Robbie has decided he wants to get really big air this time, and that's what he's going to get. All right, let's say he gets really big air, maybe even overshoots. Then he has to deal with the desert rough. Yeah, it's, it's my opinion that if he lands anywhere in the section that you and I are standing in now, that he'll have a good landing and he'll ride it on out and be able to negotiate the rough. If he lands somewhere between this, these two marks, which are somewhere in the center of this ramp, that's kind of a gray area and it still could vault him off the bike because he's falling so far. If he lands below that one, he's almost sure to, to wreck and never have a chance to negotiate what happens afterwards, which is all the cactus and the dirt and the rocks. We've got our fingers crossed. Mark, let's go back to you. It's interesting, pretty controversial, even within Team Knievel, about this landing ramp, there was much disagreement. It's going to take someone with the skill, the knowledge, the experience, and frankly, the courage to try this stunt. Robbie Knievel believes he is that man, and he will make the jump. He says, no matter what the weather this time, he's going to make the jump over the Grand Canyon tonight. We're back live, a more spectacular vista you couldn't hope for, but a more difficult jump you couldn't conceive of. Look at that flag. In a 20 mile an hour wind, already Knievel will begin to have problems. We're told the threshold is 15. Well, the winds are blowing at 21 with gusts into the low 30s. So as he tries to clear this Grand Canyon gap, he will have his work cut out for him, not only in terms of the physics of the takeoff and the physics of the landing, but the wind is anything but predictable. Well, here is something that no one has ever seen. Robbie Knievel involved in practice runs. He's over on the runway, which is in close proximity to the landing. And in a moment, he's going to be jumping, taking practice jumps, and you're going to see it all. That's coming up later. But first, this is one of the most dangerous stunts ever attempted, and not just because of the sheer distance across the canyon. With this jump, there are additional specific factors that make it a particularly daunting proposition. If this amazing stunt was to go perfectly, Robbie would hit his takeoff ramp at a top speed of 92 miles an hour. The steep angle of that velocity will launch him almost 45 feet above the landing structure and across the canyon over 200 feet to a safe and successful landing. 
On a normal jump, Robbie consistently lands on his back wheel, falling 9 to 15 feet. On this successful landing in St. Louis, notice the torque put on the bike and Robbie's unique ability to keep control using his tremendous upper body strength. But because of the difference in elevation between the two sides of the canyon, Robbie will now be falling approximately 45 feet. That's three times higher than normal. Landing on the back wheel will make it almost impossible to hold onto the bike and could result in a horrifying crash. We've seen this before, most notably at the Atco Speedway. And then there is the chance of the ultimate disaster. The worst case scenario is if something goes wrong on his takeoff. If Robbie comes up short, he would plummet to the canyon floor, 2,000 feet to certain death. That is a most chilling image indeed. And as you look at the wind blowing across from uh, takeoff to landing, you can see Knievel will really have his work cut out for him. It is not hype. These winds have been anything but cooperative. They've really kicked up in a big way this afternoon. And because of the frightening scenarios that we've just reviewed, there are emergency medical technicians on top of the landing site and at different levels of the canyon. And they're also stationed at the bottom of the canyon as well. And even though a rescue, obviously, at that point would be hopeless, we do have people everywhere blanketing the area. And, you know, it probably bears mentioning here, there is no safety net. Despite pleas to wear one, Robbie Knievel refuses to put on a parachute. So no net and no chute. And those, both those points were at his insistence. These are anxious moments for Robbie Knievel's family during these extremely dangerous jumps. Susie Culver is right now with Robbie's two biggest fans, his daughters, Kristen and Carmen Knievel. Thanks, Mark. Now, Carmen, I'm sure that you can never get used to this, but what has your dad told you about why he loves to do it? Oh, I don't know why he loves to do it. He just does. He just does it. He's not a normal dad. <laughs> but I love him. I love him very much. Well, it's a way of life, Kristen, but what do you go through days before something like this, moments before like now, and then after when it's successful? just feel really nervous and then after he makes it it's like whew. <laughs> you're just like really happy what makes you more nervous watching your dad or singing the national anthem in front of uh, millions of people I think it's half and half <laughs> <laughs> we'll be anxiously awaiting both mark back to you and you'll recall on the building the building jump that Robbie said that Kristen singing of the national anthem really inspired him so she has an important role here this evening Robbie Knievel's dream of jumping the Grand Canyon, by the way, began when he was a young boy. But like his father, Evil, he has been denied permission to jump on National Park property. After years of searching, he chanced upon this portion of the canyon, located on the sovereign lands of the Wallapai Indian Nation. Just east of Las Vegas, past the Hoover Dam, is one of the best kept secrets in the southwestern United States. Grand Canyon West. Pristine wilderness, home to the Wallapai, meaning people of the tall pines. The walls are alive. The, the, um, the canyon walls, you know, is colorful in its meaning and it's spiritual, you see. For us, it has to do with our culture and our ways of life. The Wallapai have lived along the banks of the Colorado for over a thousand years, and today they are settled on the one million acre Wallapai Indian Nation. Paved roads in an airstrip bring over 100,000 visitors a year to the reservation and provide the tribe with substantial revenues for their non-casino based economy. There are several uh, enterprises that we have here on our reservation, including um, the tourist uh, enterprise, which is one of our uh, major revenues. For the more adventurous, Wallapai River runners serve up a thrilling rush through the Colorado River Rapids. One and two day trips that combine whitewater fun 
afloat between the majestic walls of the canyon and a close-up view of America's greatest natural wonder. This is the only place where helicopter rides can be taken below the rim. Visitors can jet to the bottom of the canyon and enjoy a champagne picnic, boulder hop through the creek beds, or hike into the majestic sides of the canyon. It is truly an incredible destination. Robbie Knievel is honored that the people of the Wallapai Nation have invited him and his crew into this desert utopia to fulfill his dream of jumping Grand Canyon West. And we are all anxiously awaiting this spectacular jump over the Grand Canyon. Right now, Robbie is at the practice area prepping for this jump. Robbie's practice jumps are just to sort of acclimate himself to the takeoff and, and the ramp how his bike is running at this altitude. He obviously isn't able to duplicate this particular jump. Dan Moriarty is over at the practice area now. Dan? Thanks, Mark. You know, three weeks ago, Robbie was unable to do this practice jump because it was snowing. Now, for the first time, Robbie Knievel is about to take a practice jump on national TV, and here he comes. <laughs> Unbelievable. It looked like a perfect jump. Now, there's Bill Rundle, Robbie's mechanic, and he looks pretty happy about it. He's putting a radar device at the bottom of Robbie's takeoff ramp, which will measure his run-up speed, and here he goes again. Oh, he's feeling pretty confident. A little showboat there with the no-hands jump. That's Robbie's trademark. But it looks now like he's gone back to confer with Bill Rundle, his head mechanic, on what Bill observed about the bike during the jumps. Well, the practice jumps are over, and they were successful. They found one minor problem. It's a brand new bike. Therefore, they found some excess grease in the front wheel. What does that mean? Well, bring it back to camp and burn off the grease so that the front wheel is spinning the exact same on the takeoff as it is on the landing. That way, Robbie has more control of the bike in the air and when he comes down on the ramp. It's these small things that are very important to the practice jump. They found something good out. Mark, back to you. And it's interesting what Dan just mentioned. He's actually able to influence the pitch of the bike, is Robbie Knievel, in midair by hitting the throttle. He can bring the nose down if he punches the throttle a little bit, and he can bring the nose up if he hits the brake. So what's going on with that wheel and back in midair has everything to do with how he lands as well. By the way, I want to underscore for those just joining us that Robbie Knievel is refusing to wear a parachute because he feels that the weight of the chute on his back will throw his timing off and be too much of a hindrance in clearing the gap. So it's not just insanity. He feels there's some good reasons not to wear a chute. Next, imagine what it would be like to be both the wife and mother of a motorcycle daredevil. Coming up, an interview with Robbie's mom, Linda Knievel, and then it's time for Robbie to jump the canyon. And we're back at Grand Canyon West. Robbie Knievel minutes away from attempting this Grand Canyon jump. You saw his practice jumps, and you can see they don't even compare to what you're seeing now, which is the actual jump. His practice jump for just to give him the feel. This is a much, much, much greater distance. The difference in altitude between the takeoff ramp and the landing ramp is going to come out to be somewhere on the order of 45 feet. That's a huge crash landing on the landing side of this ramp. He hasn't rehearsed or practiced that either. So any practice that we've seen him doing is just to build his confidence and give him a feel for the bike and how it's running at this altitude. Certainly this is one of the most dangerous stunts ever attempted. Captain Robbie Knievel is going to attempt to jump his motorcycle over this very unforgiving part of Grand Canyon West. We're coming to you live for what is a very tense scene Robbie will be falling, as mentioned, three to five times farther than normal, that 45 feet. His landing really promises to be harder than any he's experienced before. Susie Culver is standing by to get some thoughts from someone very close to Robbie. Susie? Well, Mark, his mother, Linda Knievel, and it would be enough to endure one daredevil career, but you've had to endure two of them. How do you do it? Well, I think about all the sons that have died maybe going to war, maybe through accidents, diseases. Um, so many things have happened to mother's children. But to know that your son wants to do this, 
There's nothing you can do about it. They're just so headstrong. And God just gives me a peace every time. <laughs> so, um, I'm just, uh, I'm okay with this. <laughs> <laughs> Surprising enough. Yeah. Thank you. Mark, back to you. Well, that's a lady who's obviously made peace with this a long time ago. This is the business that the family is in. And these are anxious moments you heard, even as she's acknowledged by the crowd here, even in those few remarks, there can't help but be an anxiety and a tension. And the wind here continues to be a problem. It is beyond the threshold. But Robbie says no matter what the winds, even if they maintain this 21 mile an hour sustained speed and gust above 30, that he's still going to jump. That's the word out of the Knievel camp. As you know, weather was a huge setback the last time, and he doesn't want to be disappointed again. As Dan alluded to earlier, the front wheel of his uh, bike, the wheel bearing, had too much grease in it. That caused drag. It prevented the wheel from moving freely. They have burned the grease off, and the bike now, I'm told, is ready to go. So we are all now anxiously awaiting the moment when Captain Robbie Knievel will cheat death one more time. It's an extraordinary display of mental focus and physical prowess. Let's take a look at this background on this remarkable motorcycle daredevil. Born Robert Knievel, May 7th, 1962. Robbie grew up surrounded by the bigger-than-life images of a real American hero. His father was an icon, the greatest stuntman in the world. When my dad was in his prime, he was very generous, very generous. And um, he loved a lot of people around. I guess he, he loved a big party. Having Evil Knievel as a father was uh, wild. As a child, the entire Knievel family traveled around the country with their dad. Many trips passed by the Grand Canyon. For Robbie, this is where the dream began. By the time I was 11, I was wheeling, you know, all the way across the football field, going through the gears on a bike twice the size of me. And I had 50,000 people live uh, cheering me on, going crazy. Look at that little kid doing that. I was like, this is what I want to do for a living. He started breaking records before he was old enough to vote. To date, he's jumped over trucks, over planes, and over limousines. He currently holds 17 world records, including a successful jump over the fountains at Caesar's Palace. The longest distance record. And a series of no hands jumps. Being a world-class daredevil means that Robbie breaks records and he breaks bones. He performs only about 20 times each year, but being a daredevil is a full-time job, 24-7. Each jump requires at least two weeks of planning, and Team Knievel is a road-based crew. Ramps, equipment, and motorcycles are driven to every location. Plus, there's a constant demand for public appearances, and literally hundreds of interviews with newspaper, radio, and television reporters. Robbie has designed a custom-made bike for the California Motorcycle Company part of the celebrity series that also feature Peter Fonda and Evil Knievel design bikes. And it's that commitment that allows him to ride with his dad. There are constant comparisons to Robbie and his legendary father, but only three things stand out. Their love of God, country, and devotion to their young fans. And as the wind continues to blow across Grand Canyon West, we're told from the Knievel camp that Robbie will jump. But there are many factors besides just the weather that can affect this jump. Standing by is a man that has been with Team Knievel for over 20 years. Bill Rundle is his name, and he started with Evil Knievel and has been with Robbie ever since he began jumping. No stranger to motorcycles, Bill was a flat track champion himself and is now Robbie's chief mechanic, closest confidant, and his advisor as well. He's actually more like a brother to Robbie than anything else. Dan Moriarty is with Bill now. Thank you, Mark. Bill, you had a slight problem in practice. What do you do to take care of that to make sure this bike can run? Well, this was a new bike. We're getting ready to jump, so we had to burn the grease off the front axle and just clean everything up to get the wheel to spin nice and free. So we've got that problem corrected and we're ready to go. So it's locked in. Now you're at 5,000 feet elevation up here. The air's thinner. You have to do something to this bike to make sure it can go, well, as fast as possible. 
Right. Well, we can, we were up here and spent some time on the bike before we got snowed out, so we were pretty close. We made some changes today to make sure that some jetting changes to make sure that it's that it's uh, running at its top speed, and it is right now. So we're ready to go. I'm uh, I'm sure Robbie will be setting a world record tonight. He's going to air it out there. As a best friend, almost a brother, once this bike's ready to go and he takes off down this 660-foot ramp, you can do nothing else. So what does Bill do? I'm going to say a long prayer. You know what? And we'll all say a prayer with him. Mark, back to you. I think there'll be a lot of praying going on here for Robbie, for the, the conditions to improve just modestly to see any let up in this wind. And Robbie himself is going through a mental exercise. You can see him there live in his trailer. He visualizes a successful jump. This is one of the techniques that he uses repeatedly. He tries to focus on what he has to do on every jump. And obviously here there are a great number of things he has to focus on. We're just minutes away from Robbie's biggest challenge of his life. I'm Mark Thompson, and we're here live at Grand Canyon West, one of the most majestic spots on the planet. And this promises to be one of the most thrilling nights of network television you'll ever see. Robbie Knievel once again set to jump his motorcycle from one side of the canyon over the rocky cliffs, across the gorge, some 2,000 feet deep below, and land on the other side. Even his technical people say that there are huge problems with this particular jump, not the least of which is the landing platform, and the wind has now become an issue as well. A number of factors enter into this stunt in addition to just the distance. Any number of things could go wrong. This amazing stunt was to go perfectly. Robbie would hit his takeoff ramp at a top speed of 92 miles an hour. The steep angle of that velocity will launch him almost 45 feet above the landing structure and across the canyon over 200 feet to a safe and successful landing. On a normal jump, Robbie consistently lands on his back wheel, falling 9 to 15 feet. On this successful landing in St. Louis, notice the torque put on the bike and Robbie's unique ability to keep control using his tremendous upper body strength. But because of the difference in elevation between the two sides of the canyon, Robbie will now be falling approximately 45 feet. That's three times higher than normal. Landing on the back wheel will make it almost impossible to hold on to the bike and could result in a horrifying crash. We've seen this before, most notably at the Atco Speedway. And then there is the chance of the ultimate disaster. The worst case scenario is if something goes wrong on his takeoff. If Robbie comes up short, he would plummet to the canyon floor, 2,000 feet to certain death. Even knowing that's a simulation, it's very, very difficult to watch. Because of the danger and the complexities of this jump and the terrain over which it's taking place, precautions have been taken on several levels, literally, really. First of all, two emergency medical technicians, who, by the way, are also professional mountain guides, are stationed at the bottom of the canyon. If Robbie winds up down there, it's likely that no manner of medical attention will make a difference. And halfway up the canyon are two more EMTs. They are with one of our cliffhanging camera operators up top and on the other side of the canyon in the case of a bad landing on the ramp or even over the ramp there are EMTs an ambulance and a medevac helicopter so there are safety measures for what might happen after the fact but Robbie will be out there all alone when it's time to jump and that time is drawing near we told you that we can't tell you the exact time Robbie jumps but you can see he's displaying confidence. He's in his leathers in the trailer. He has not been able to simulate the actual jump for obvious reasons. He's taken a couple of practice jumps, but they don't begin to approach what we're about to see. The Robbie Knievel Grand Canyon death jump continues in a moment. We're back live at the Grand Canyon, and we are seconds away from a moment very, very much anticipated. Robbie Knievel is 
in minutes going to make this jump. That is his trailer. And it is my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce to you the world's greatest motorcycle daredevil. Here he is, Captain Robbie Knievel. Robbie stands at the top of the takeoff platform surveying the huge gap that will be between him and the landing platform below. And you can see by the flags behind him on either side, the wind is blowing substantially. Now that's a crosswind he will have to account for, as I'm told, more with speed than anything else. He can't count on it being there because the wind gusts back and forth. But for more insights on what Robbie is thinking right now, let's go to our Susie Colbert. Suze? All right, Mark. We're going to greet Robbie as he comes down here, and I'm sure he has some things that he would like to say to this crowd that has gathered out here at the Grand Canyon. Robbie, it's your stage. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure to be here for the one I would call, especially with the uh, wind today, the number one toughest jump I've ever attempted. I did make it to my 37th birthday, May 7th. Thank God for that. I uh, really have to thank the uh, Wallapai Indian tribe for having me here. It's been a pleasure. You've all been great. Thanks a lot. I um, would also like to thank my family who showed up today. I know my father's still having a lot of health problems. And I think I can speak for all the stuntmen around the world and thank a great man, a huge legend, a man who created his own sport and paved the way for me and a lot of other stuntmen. Thanks, Dad. I know you're home watching. I want to concentrate on my run-ups, on the ramps, um, the wind's not too bad. I am going to go for it. Uh, God always takes care of me. I got him on my side, and uh, I would like to stand and, like I did before every race when I was younger, and listen to the national anthem from uh, one of the prettiest little girls in the world, my daughter, Kristen. And also, my other daughter, Carmen's here, who just came into my family and filled a big part of my heart when she was 16 years old and I love you as much as Kristen and always will and I'm glad you're part of the family now you filled a big part in my heart honey I love you I'll see you guys after the jump Robbie before Kristen sings the national anthem we've talked so much about the landing here what's your take on it the landing I don't even care about. I want to get over that hole is all I'm concerned about. I'm going to go like hell. I'm going to live life full throttle, California Motorcycle Company. I want to also, from the bottom of my heart, tell Tri-Crown Productions, who I've worked with for two years in Fox, Carol Sherman, Jeff Androsky, everybody that helped and was involved, I love you from the bottom of my heart. God says you can put all the commandments into one, and that's love. Everybody keep that in their heart. All right, proud papa, let's turn it over to your daughter. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the national anthem performed by Kristen Knievel. Oh, 
brave little girl and her very courageous father when we come back we've waited for it it's here the jump three weeks ago the weather was prohibitive with cold with wind with snow and rain tonight the wind is here but everything else appears to be playing in Robbie's favor, but don't underestimate the wind conditions. Robbie can say, as he did in his remarks just a moment ago, that the wind looks good. But the first thing he said when he left his trailer, his very first statement was, given the wind, this will be my most difficult jump. And believe me, that is the truth. 15 miles an hour is the threshold and we are well in excess of 15 miles an hour, gusts into the mid-20s to even 30 miles an hour. Now, what I'm told is that generally, Robbie will grab a bunch of throttle, as they say it. In other words, get a big speed to try to compensate for any sudden wind gusts or even a sustained wind that would be running into the 20s and 30s. But when he grabs all that throttle, his work will be cut out for him on the other end. Because as he has to, in essence, put a constraint on all that throttle on the landing, he'll have huge problems as he runs out of ramp. That's the takeoff ramp. Robbie cannot see the landing ramp from that takeoff ramp, and that's because the landing ramp is so much lower. The canyon just simply doesn't match up. There is a reason that people don't jump the Grand Canyon. This is one of them. The canyon edges are not even, so that the landing ramp is well below the takeoff ramp. That's one of the huge problems and ongoing challenges that Camp Knievel has faced. Bill Rundle, Robbie's lifelong friend and his chief mechanic, reviewing with him everything that could go wrong and everything that could go right about this jump. We told you that from a technical standpoint, the bike is fairly sound. They found too much grease that they burned off of one of the wheels. But at this point, the bike is running well. You may say, well, why does he go back and forth on the takeoff ramp? Why doesn't he just do it? The fact is, he has to get the feel of the bike. There are no speedometers on the bike, for example. Robbie is one of those people who really believes in his instincts and really believes that the best way to do it is to get the feel of the bike. And that's what he's trying to do now. This is a crowd that has swollen substantially through the day, made up of many Wallapai Nation tribes people. You can hear them in the background. And also many friends and family of Team Canaveral. That's a chance just to practice run. When Robbie actually takes off remains something of a mystery right now. It will be 
imminent. It's going to be within a couple of moments. But what run he actually decides to try to hit the gap on, right now we can't say with certainty. He'll have to just feel that it's right. The gap is enormous. He'll have to be traveling at close to 100 miles an hour to make it cleanly. Let's go over to Susie Colbert. Susie? Mark, I spent a lot of time up on those ramps the last couple of days, and the key really is the focus. It's almost impossible to stand up there and not catch the canyon in your peripheral view, but that's what Robbie must do is block everything else out, focus specifically on just the ramps, on what's ahead of him. Mark? Well, it's interesting. The Wallapai people actually have a name for the kinds of winds that we've seen just in the last few minutes here. And focus or not, these devil winds, as they're called, come right up out of the canyon. And they can materialize out of relative calm. And that is what we've seen here. Rundle is yelling. Rundle is yelling something to one of the crew. And Robbie is... Robbie is reorienting himself. Bill is yelling. Bill is yelling actually that there is a. I believe he's yelling that there is a small. Is it a fire? Is, he, is that what he's saying? Someone else. No, it's not. It's nothing to worry about. It's one of the fire works, I believe. It's. You can see them attending to it actually below Robbie's position. So that's all Bill was worried about. It's nothing that will threaten the jump. You can see Team Knievel yelling back and forth about something. There's something that they don't like. Bobby looks like he has all the determination that he had this morning. When we first arrived here, after what happened three weeks ago, I looked at Robbie and I said, are we going this time? And he said, absolutely, no matter what, I'm going. And he has that confidence and that determination as he pulls up to that takeoff ramp one last time. Well, now the Team Knievel members who were on the landing platform are clearing. It looks like they are getting ready to jump. Gary has given him a go-ahead. That's Gary Davis in the checkered shirt. If you're just joining us, Robbie Knievel live. That's Bill Rundle, his head mechanic, on his left. Robbie Knievel will attempt to hit this gap family members are gathered his daughters are here his mother is here this is a long awaited moment a lifelong dream for robbie knievel and the degree of difficulty is unquantifiable there is no way to rehearse it no way to practice it this looks like it will be the jump run The winds continue gusty, but they've slackened just a bit. They still look like they're somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 miles an hour. Remember that landing ramp well below the takeoff ramp. Robbie can't see it from where he is now. He can't see where he's landing. He'll have to orient himself right. He'll have to hit his speed right without a speedometer, I remind you. And they'll have to land perfectly. Focus, the intensity, he'll need two of the five gears that are on that bike. He'll start in second, and he'll take off in fifth. When he lands, it's all break. Here's the run. Knievel attempting to jump the Grand Canyon. Yes! He's hit the gap. He makes it. He's off the bike. He's made the gap cleanly, but just as feared. He took the tumble when he hit the cactus in the dirt. The minute he got off the ramp. Those are EMTs handling the situation now. They're the first ones on the scene. Is Robbie okay? That was a nasty tumble he took when he hit the dirt. That was a tremendous force of impact. Remember, he's coming down at over 90 miles an hour. We are waiting to hear and see whether or not Knievel is okay. 
I've mentioned that there are medevac there are medevac units standing by. They will put him on that flatboard. That's Gary Davis. Let's go over to Dan with Gary now. Dan. Gary, we think he may have a broken leg. But the helmet came off, which is a very good sign. Yeah, we got the helmet off of him. We were having trouble. It was and his head kicked real crooked, so we couldn't pull it off as smooth as we'd like to. <laughs> He's okay. He may have broken his leg, but <laughs> it was a hell of a ride. He was out over, I can't say, 220? Oh, yeah, he, he, he's well over his long jump record. He landed farther down the ramp than, than well, he on the right said that I didn't want him to land. He landed below that second mark. He told me if he landed out there, he'd get bolted off the bike, and he had, he rode a hell of a ride. Gary, we're going to go to replay right now. From your memory, as you see it happening, in your mind's eye, he took the ramp perfectly, had great, great height. Was there any drawback at all through the jump? beside the land. He got cocked in the air. He was, he was a little cocked. He, he, got, he, got, he got the bike cocked in the air. He came down with the front end too high. When it slapped the front end down, it threw him off. Yeah, he is actually calling for people to leave him alone for a moment. But you can see he hit the takeoff very cleanly, and he hits the landing cleanly, but then he gets oriented forward. That's exactly what Gary's talking about. Right here, the bike gets oriented forward. And of course, it's not helped by the fact that he runs out of landing ramp and hits the dirt. But the best news is that Robbie Knievel has survived this incredible jump. There are Robbie, Robbie and Gary now. Dan? One heck of a jump. Get away from these idiots. Come here, Dan. Uh -oh. <laughs> We're both still alive. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Gary Davis here. Here's a shot of the takeoff from the helmet camera that Robbie wears at close to 100 miles an hour. That's what it looks like to fly over the Grand Canyon. And here is the landing, way down the landing ramp. So that's why they were talking about perhaps a new record in terms of distance. And then you'll be able to see as he runs into the dirt and heads head over heels over the bar that we lose the camera. But you can imagine the jubilance. Everyone's rushing up to Robbie because, frankly, we didn't know that he would live through this. Here is Robbie's jump again, and this... These are his daughters looking on. Take a look. Yes! He's hit the gap. He makes it. He's off the bike. He's made the gap cleanly, but just as feared. I was saying, just as feared, he ran out of landing ramp. And he did, but you can see the Knievel daughters running to his side. Everyone is elated, broken leg or not to see Robbie Knievel achieve a new world record 228 feet. And as suggested, he had so much speed off of that takeoff ramp, he was actually able to sky himself 228 feet for the new record. Here's another replay. And again, the landing he hits well, but then when he runs out of ramp, he becomes oriented in such a way that there was just no way to stay on the bike. There's his takeoff. Remember, he can't see the landing. Now he sees the landing strip, and he's able to hit it. He hits it well, but way down the strip. And you can see the front wheel begin to, to give. It is remarkable when you consider the things that could have happened that he emerges with only a broken leg. Robbie Knievel, a triumphant moment. Gary Davis at his side, and Team Knievel comes over to congratulate him. Among them is our Dan Moriarty. Dan? I got Robbie here. Robbie Knievel. Robbie, do me a favor. Here's your camera. Here's your fans. Uh -huh. Talk to me. Well, let's, I'm a little dinged up. I, I hung on until I crashed, didn't I? Oh, yeah. What? I huh? brought it to the ground. Nice to see you. Robbie, you jumped halfway to Vegas. 
<laughs> hey, Lonnie, how you doing? I might need you in a minute. Oh, no, no, you're looking good. You're looking good. I'm here. <laughs> I'm walking. White man can jump. That's right. You. <laughs> All right, man. <laughs> what canyon we at? <laughs> I'm still knocked a little silly, but uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm a little dingy in the head. I'm not sure what's going on right now. <gasps> oh, man. Yeah. Well, it will be an evening of Robbie congratulating being congratulated, I should say, and an evening of thanks. He has so many people to thank. We have run long to, to bring you the spectacular conclusion to a long-awaited jump, and our congratulations to Robbie Knievel. For Susie Colbert and Dan Moriarty, I'm Mark Thompson, reminding you that Busted Everywhere continues next on Fox, and this spectacular jump brought us all a thrill worth waiting for. Our thanks again. Good night, and God bless. <laughs>